It is a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Sarah Moore. Many of you will know uh, Sarah's work um, uh, because she is chair of the National Forum for Enhancement of Teaching and Learning. Uh, and that's been a very important job that is having an increasing impact, I think, on all of our lives. And uh, certainly as librarians, we're delighted that it is and that we're all getting to play a role. She is also Associate Vice President Academic at UL. But I think it's fair to say, Sarah, that your uh, national role has become uh, almost as more important than your institutional role over the last couple of years due to uh, the influence it's having on the sector. Um, Sarah has written extensively uh, about the areas of organisational behaviour, educational innovation, uh, academic CPD, and uh, I'm very pleased to note that amongst her publications, librarians have contributed chapters to them, so she's worked closely with, with libraries and librarians for, for many years. In addition to all that, she has also written two novels. So Sarah must be one of those people who has 26 hours in her day or something like that, and uh, always makes me very, very, uh, very, very um, jealous. But it's a great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Sarah Moore from University of Limerick. Carl, thanks a million, and it's just such a pleasure to be here. I'm very um, privileged that you uh, decided to invite me to come and talk to you, and um, I, I get this kind of feeling of huge warmth and connection, and it feels like a really special conference. And you know the way when you've been around the circuit as long as some of us have been, you kind of automatically get a sense of a culture when you arrive somewhere, and there's something terribly connected and... Um, supportive and magical about the way I think um, that you talk to each other and about each other and the way that you decide uh, to run your events I think it's really important I wonder can I bring this down a little bit because I feel I'm it's a slight barrier between me and now if I do that can everyone still hear me yeah great so um, I, I thought that I would start by uh, asking you all to do a little bit of work if that's okay um, because I'm feeling a little bit tired and I thought maybe that it'd be if, it, if I start my keynote by getting some ideas from you I'll feel much more um, energized I think um, so uh, before I ask you to do that though I just want to talk to you a little bit about what I'm going to, to focus on today I'd like to talk about the work of the National Forum and its focus on teaching and learning because that's where my head has been um, and I'd like to kind of ask you a bit of advice in relation to some of that work uh, because I think that you are all in a unique position uh, to help with some of the deliberations and the activities that we're involved in. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, some of the research that we've conducted in the National Forum since it was established. Um, but most of all, I think I'd like to have a conversation with all of you, those in the national libraries, those in the university libraries, um, the kinds of experiences that you've had about the role and the expertise and the ways of engaging that deliver and provide so much already and that have the potential to do even more despite the challenges that we all face and that we talk about all the time. So in the first instance, I'm going to ask you uh, if you could consider these very simple questions. So even though I'm asking you to work, I'm not going to ask you to work that hard. Um, <laughs> So uh, here are the three questions. And what I'd like to ask you to do is, um, in the spirit of kind of reflection, is just to not to talk to anybody about this in the first instance. Maybe about, about three minutes, just quietly reflecting on these questions and maybe jotting down some of the um, answers that, you, uh, that occur to you. And then what I'd like you to do is turn to the person next to you or behind you and see whether you've come up with similar or different answers, if that's OK. So here are my three questions. What role do librarians play in the enhancement of teaching and learning? And I'm asking you to focus. I know that you play many other roles, and kind of the whole research role is obviously extremely important in terms of your curation and facilitation and engagement. But I'm asking you to focus on teaching and learning in particular um, in this instance. What role could, librari could librarians play in the enhancement of teaching and learning that they're not playing now? Um, and what are the biggest challenges to li libraries realising their potential in that, um, in that space in terms of teaching and learning? There's one other question that I'd like uh, to you to answer if you can, and this is just a one word thing. Y you know how sometimes explaining your role is actually quite difficult, particularly in academic environments? Um, I wonder, would can any of you identify a metaphor? Some people talk about librarians as tour guides for knowledge. Some people talk about them as midwives, as cur curators, 
as creators. I wonder, could you uh, choose a metaphor that best describes the role of the librarian within your contexts? Because I think that would be also very interesting for, for me to hear about. So we're, I'm going to give you three minutes to do that, and then I'll tell you when those three minutes are up. So just reflecting quietly first for three minutes, and then I'll ask you to turn to the people next to you. Um, and, and perhaps you just n jot down uh, some of your answers. So if you write to yourselves um, and just think about those questions. So one minute left just for those reflections. Okay, I'm now going to ask you to spend three minutes, and again, I'll keep it fairly tight, um, just talking to the person next to you or behind you or in clusters of two or three, just about some of the ideas that occurred to you um, in response to those simple questions. Or maybe they're not so simple, uh, but certainly they're things that maybe uh, you can reflect on. <laughs> Noise, yeah, last. <laughs>
Oh, I love you. Okay, everybody, um, I wonder can I get you all back uh, after the interesting and animated discussions that you've been having. Thank you. Um, I, it, I think it's always really interesting, and I just had a quick chat with some of you, um, to, to look at the difference between what you're sort of almost the pragmatics of your current situation are, uh, are, um, uh, are almost forcing us into in some ways um, versus what ideally the role we could play. So what do we do and what could we do? I always think they're really interesting questions because it's the gap between those that kind of is full of potential and promise and creativity and, and interest, I guess. So um, can I just very quickly get anybody to shout out some of the things that they uh, identified in terms of what role the libraries play now in terms, uh, just looking at question one. Anybody? Knowledge management. Knowledge management. Um, again, that whole piece of um, being able to, particularly now in a world that is increasingly digital, um, and in, in a world that has bombarded with knowledge, and you've heard this over and over again, and this is something that we've come across in the National Forum in all of our consultations. How do we face the challenges of working and learning and living in a world that is increasingly digital? Um, it seems to me that the libraries play an enormously important role in this, an enorm and an irreplaceable role uh, that the world doesn't fully understand, I think. Um, and yet knowledge management is at the core of so much of what you do. And I'm, on, I'm speaking as somebody who's not a librarian, but who, who um, has had uh, lots of interaction with the kind of work that, that you do. Knowledge management, I think, very central. Anything else? Provision of learning space. Provision of learning space. I'm going to revisit that because I think that's a very profound thing. That's not a glib thing, that, uh, or it's not an intangible thing. It's a really strong pragmatic but emotionally important in terms of people's learning, the provision of learning space and of special learning space, of almost, may I hazard, kind of sacred space sometimes that, uh, that you know when you've arrived in a library and something has changed from wh th the moment you were outside of the library to the moment that you've gone inside the library. I think that's terribly important and I'm going to revisit that in some of the things that I'm saying. Thank you, Carmel. Anything else? Um, so, sorry, could you just say that again? Information and yeah, information and study skills. Um, and I think, uh, uh, again, that real support in terms of learning support um, and assistance and time, and I'm going to revisit the issue of time as well. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you, Donna. The proprietors of possibility, um, looking at what's out there all the time and being in a unique position uh, to do that. I think that's, again, something terribly powerful. Thank you. And again, I'm going to be very brief, and I know that you've probably mentioned an awful lot more other roles, but they're really four really interesting ones, which we'll come back to. Um, is there anything about the potential of the libraries then? What role could you be playing? Or is this um, I, I mean, I think you've declared four really, even in that short s space of time, four really interesting aspects that could possibly be developed more if you had more resources, if you had more space, um, and, and I, I think resources obviously are really important. Is there anything that you felt, though, in terms of potential that libraries could be doing if they had, um, if they could fulfil their ideal potential? Anyone? Okay, very interesting, and I'm going to revisit that as well. I think that's a powerful point. Could, more, could be more connected with the curriculum. Anything else? High-level digital literacy skills. High-level digital literacy skills. I believe you've talked a lot about digital literacy so far in this conference, and it's probably something that exercises you a lot. Um, and high-level digital literacy, I think, is a very important notion. Um, the, in our experience, digital literacy 
is a poorly understood concept. It's a contested concept. Um, and yeah, and there are different levels of digital literacy. And we talk a lot about these mythical digital natives. And librarians can tell you something very different about whether students are digital natives or not, or what kinds of skills they have. And so high level digital literacy uh, is a different concept than just being digitally aware or living in a world that's digital. Um, and I think that's uh, important too. And I'll, I'll come back to that as well. Anything else? Uh, yeah. That's a really kind of strategic role for the libraries. And thank you. And again, that, that, that collaboration, that cooperation, and that embeddedness with what the, um, our overall missions as educational institutions are. Mary, sorry, did you have something? I was just going to say the management of research data as well. Yeah. The, uh, and the research role, I guess, of the libraries and how um, research and teaching can be best integrated uh, via the work of the libraries, I think, is another very interesting area. Thank you. I'm going to come back to the other things, maybe the, some of the barriers and metaphors uh, later on at the discussion, but I, I, that's giving me an awful lot of material to kind of hook on to some of the, stu the other stuff that, uh, that I'd like to talk about, because I think that really aligns with some of the insights that we've had in the National Forum in terms of our, um, uh, our mandate and our consultations and our work. So... These are the kinds of things that are going on inside your heads. You're, you're saying we could be perhaps more connected to the curriculum. We could be playing a very powerful strategic role. There may be a sense that we're not fulfilling that potential, unless I'm overstating that. Um, but already you're playing very strategic roles because knowledge management is key to what you do. The notion of providing this very important space, this learning environment, the provision of information skills, which are increasingly important in this digital world. Let's look very quickly, and I'm not going to rehearse things that you already know, but our national strategy to 2030, otherwise known as the Hunt Report, the High Level European Report, otherwise known as the McAleese Report, um, all are saying some very interesting things about teaching and learning, which very few of us can argue with. I can kind of summarise it by saying that really um, our policies are telling us from a teaching and learning perspective, we are looking for excellence in teaching and learning, we are looking for, uh, our, our policy is guiding us towards getting feedback from students and responding effectively to that feedback. Our uh, policy uh, advisors and documents and uh, leaders are saying we need research informed, research led, research driven, research integrated learning environments. We need to focus on the important principles of adjustment, retention, progression for students, paying attention to the key transition times. Um, because they're the most difficult times for learners, as, as the research has told us. Where our policy advisors and leaders and documents are telling us employability is important, uh, graduate attributes are important, quality is important, assurance, standards, processes, competence among our teaching staff and those who teach and those who support learning are important. None of these things we can really argue with. Um, and yet it, there is a sense that there's a lot of potential in terms of enhancement that we're not quite um, hooking on yet. We all have a sense of discomfort that there are aspects of excellence, of research integrated learning that we could be um, embracing uh, more effectively. So that's the, the research uh, terrain. Um, I, I think that uh, many of those research uh, or policy issues are very interestingly embraced by our libraries. And you've mentioned some of the issues already. Um, you know, I, it's, it's very important to recognize, and you've probably heard this before, that what a university or a community thinks about its library is a measure of what it thinks about its education. So the attention that we pay to our libraries is an indicator of the attention that we pay to those important principles um, of teaching and learning. And I don't think we should make any mistake about that. But I think that there's also something interesting happening. I think there's an invisibility 
about libraries. I think there's a taken for grantedness, um, a risk of undervaluing. Um, the problem is that there's a truism around libraries that may be true. A great library risks going unnoticed because it's always there and it does what people need it to do. And so there's a kind of quietness about the power of a library. And sometimes I think that quietness is a little bit too quiet. And I'm just going to throw that out there as a possibility for all of you to think about. And I might be completely wrong about that. But I think there's an under the radarness about all of the complex work that librarians do. And I notice when I talk to students, or even ordin when I say ordinary academics, I'm talking probably about people who teach their subject in classrooms and in laboratories and um, in tutorials. When I ask them what the role um, of the library is, two things happen. Uh, they, they'll, they'll say one of two things. They make it out to be a much less complicated thing than it is. Um, and some of them talk about it in these mystical terms. They don't really know what librarians do. They know they do important, interesting, maybe sometimes even mystical things, but they don't know what they are. So they've never really quite looked under that bonnet. So they've either oversimplified it, or they've over, or they've stopped, or, or they, it's so complicated they can't even go there. And I think that's a very interesting thing to reflect on. The rest of the world that you serve see you in, in ways that they don't fully understand, um, and understand you in ways that I think they're not fully clear about. And, um, and perhaps we can think about that as, uh, as Perhaps that's something worth thinking about and discussing a little bit more. Um, so don't get taken for granted. Look at, at uh, this chart and when we look at some of the issues to do with, when you're lobbying for resources, when you're saying the libraries are important, when you're saying uh, people don't fully understand what we, what we do, then I think that, uh, um, particularly when it comes to the allocation of resources, I think that looking at the hard figures are important as well. Let me look at the figures on institutional investment in teaching and learning as an example. And this could probably be seen for uh, so many different aspects and dynamics of what it is that we do in higher education. So this is investment in teaching and learning initiatives um, over time, starting with 2000 and ending in 2012. I know it's a little bit outdated, but I suppose that's the year that the National Forum was announced. And so we were looking at um, innovation and enhancement in a world where our economic kind of health had fallen off a cliff. And we'd seen a huge amount of investment in a whole range of different projects. Um, NDLR, NERTL, SIF, Learner Support, LIN Networks, a whole range of really interesting conversations started to happen in the noughties, shall we say, particularly in the late noughties. And then we see that um, at the end of 2011, and many of you will have suffered from the slings and arrows of this, uh, all of that kind of um, funding terrain changed really dramatically. So innovation and enhancement in a radically changed economic context. This has focused our minds. We were talking about this at breakfast this morning. And uh, the National Forum, because it was established right at the time when the finances were at their most compromised, I guess, in terms of the trajectory, um, has been very aware uh, of this. Here, very quickly, just for your information, and particularly for those of you who might not be aware of what the National Forum is doing, is the work plan for the first two years of the National Forum. We are in the second year of those first two years, um, and at the end of 2015, we'll be reporting on all of these five <coughs> domains of activity. So here are our five domains. We are looking at professional development in teaching and learning with a view to creating a framework for professional development for higher education teachers and for those who teach in higher education. Our definition of those, uh, of those who teach include uh, people uh, who are uh, education developers, librarians, uh, tutors, those who provide learner support, as well as those people who provide that direct um, academic uh, uh, teaching within a conventional setting. Uh, we have been charged with learning impact awards, with looking across the sector and recognising and celebrating people who have had a, an outstanding impact on student learning. 
and we want to ensure that that's not just the teachers in the classroom, that that's also uh, relates to the kind of work that you've all led and that you're all involved in. Um, we want to engage and have engaged in scholarship and teaching and learning. We've funded a range of very focused research projects uh, many of which involve uh, library work in terms of looking at what kinds of resources are available in terms of being organised and focused and um, effective in targeting the kind of work that we think will inform the sector most effectively. We've worked on a whole range of strategies and roadmaps in relation to building digital capacity to support teaching and learning. And we've taken um, a partnership and collaboration approach to bringing groups together who have expertise that can allow us together uh, to create a more effective higher education environment for, for learners um, in Ireland. So there are five domains of expertise. The focus is on enhancement and the kind of dynamics that are feeding that are innovation, the valuing of teaching, celebrating teaching, recognising that good teaching often happens under the radar and fantastic learning is happening all the time with the kinds of collaboration that we have within our institutions, but also recognising that there are things that we can do to develop, to inform and to improve those activities. So there the focus. Please look, at, um, because a, a, a detailed analysis of all of the uh, activities that we're involved in is beyond the scope of this morning's talk, but please look at teachingandlearning.ie, teaching and learning, all one word, um, .ie, because all of the activities of the National Forum are well documented on that website. And um, we'd be very keen on hearing more from any of you in relation to those enhancements and to the kinds of expertise that you can bring. We were involved in lots of conversations and activities with uh, many of you, but please, the door is open. We really want an open line of communication between you and the work that we're, we're trying to achieve. So generally then, the purpose of the National Forum is promoting innovative fresh thinking, moving from really good examples of fantastic practice to national frameworks that we can all share and, and work from. And you talked about the importance of collaboration. From discrete projects to comprehensive change. And the idea then is to establish Ireland as a place where higher education, teaching and learning is known to be excellent and held up as an international road mo role model. How do we know if we have been successful? What will success look like? if we achieve the things that we think we can achieve with the expertise that we have. One of the indicators, and again, it's one of many, is that people from other parts of the world will say, what, what are they doing in Ireland? Why is Ireland um, achieving things that we can't achieve here? That's the kind of indicator. We're already starting to see evidence of that. And um, we've seen, interestingly, evidence of that for a long time. But because of the way in which the National Forum has been nourished by the expertise in our sector, and possibly because we're a small enough country to continue to talk to each other all the time, um, there are um, delegations of people who've been um, wanting to know uh, how the Irish higher education um, system is surviving in the kinds of um, economically sort of disastrous environment that it's done, so, done in the last couple of years. What are some of the things that we have learned um, from the kinds of consultations that we've been involved in? Um, institutions, first of all, don't necessarily work as one unit. Uh, communication across and between academic units is often very poor. Uh, sometimes you don't discover something that's happening within your own institution until you come to a conference like this and then you suddenly discover that somebody down your corridor has been involved in all sorts of interesting work. We are very fragmented and we're very siloed in our academic institutions. And it's why um, an environment like this is so terribly important. The issue of parity of esteem between teaching and research continues to be a huge challenge. Research um, uh, incentives, uh, the award and the valorization of our best researchers um, often happens or is perceived to happen at the expense of our focus on excellent teaching. Um, we also know that to a large extent, teaching and learning and central resources, including the library, often exist in parallel rather than integrated with disciplines, departments and schools. And it's a point that one of you made earlier on um, in relation to the, uh, the, the connectedness with the curriculum. Um, but out of all of these things that we've learnt, Time is a crucial concept, and I'm particularly aware of it as that red uh, uh, light is flashing at me. 
and it's something that Carmel has referred to, making time to reflect on what uh, we're doing and what we plan to do, taking time to pay attention to what's going on for our students, giving time to guide and coax and encourage and to engage and to motivate, protecting time to keep up with and to develop our own knowledge and expertise, saving time, which I think is something that librarians are particularly good at, by developing smart approaches to research, to search and selection, providing time for student interaction, problem solving and activity. That space you talked about, um, that, that we have heard again and again, that time is one of the big barriers to effective learning. And the ways that, the creative ways that libraries can get students and researchers and academics and communities to think about and to work with time, it seems to me to be terribly important. Our libraries are the places where teaching and research are introduced to each other, where scholarship and learning go hand in hand. It seems to me, and none of the things that we've looked at over the last two years have, have contradicted this view, quite the opposite, that libraries offer us integrative solutions to so many of the challenges that we face and share. Undergraduates meet postgraduates, the arts meet the sciences, Communities come into contact with researchers, readers meet writers, thinkers meet doers, problems meet solutions, questions meet answers. What's very clear to me is that your expertise matters and it risks being taken for granted or even misunderstood. If you are not invited to important strategic discussions, then crash the party. Show learners and teachers the thousand ways they need you insist on going to the meetings, declare the roles that you play, explain to the rest of your uh, organizations and to our entire system what it is that you do. Strategy, advocacy, pedagogy, scholarship, retention, quality, creativity, care. Libraries can be protected space for quiet reflection too, but now is not the time to be quiet. Time to shout about your transformational roles as tour guides of knowledge, as curators of curiosity, as purveyors of potential, as the experts that we need more than ever in this increasingly digital and complex world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. That's uh, inspiring and insightful stuff and a great start to the morning. Um, we do have some time for questions, about five minutes, so uh, I think there's a mic uh, over here on, the, on, the, on, on, the, on your right. And uh, so please put your hand up and Ellen will bring the mic to you. And I thought also that while you're asking the questions, if the metaphors that I asked about uh, earlier on occurred to you, perhaps you'd let everybody know what metaphors you think uh, summarise or explain libraries better, because that might be a good way of helping to instruct the wider community in ways that possibly we need. Thank you, Cahal. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting indeed. I'm struck by the um, terms you have on that last slide, strong walls. And I think it would be a generally accepted opinion that the um, relationships between the teaching and learning units in universities and the libraries is based on relationship rather than on formalized partnership. And I think that's a real risk. Um, and I, so the experience varies from university to university from um, within the different library sectors. And I wonder, could you comment about how the forum could be proactive in building partnership and in, in explicitly stating, like you say, break into the meetings. And, you know, it's, it sounds all very positive. <laughs> right, yeah. In the real world, yeah. it's almost impossible. So okay. I think from the forum, it, that type of talk would be really interesting to see it documented. And that relationship and the um, importance of the relationship and importance of including the information specialists as part of the teaching and learning agenda would, would be a very great step forward um, if, for achieving success. Yeah. Thank you very much. And your, your name? Ursula Byrne, UCD Library. Oh, Ursula. Yeah, thank you very much, Ursula. Um, and I no. suppose my word would be just uh, c coming back to you would be enablers. Enablers, that's good. Yeah. And I, if I can collect some of those, I think that'd be really useful. And I think we need enablers more than ever. Ursula, I, I wouldn't for a moment want you to think that some of the things that I said were kind of facetious or, um, and uh, again, crashing the party. We can crash the party in all sorts of different ways. And I think you're absolutely right. It's not enough 
that there are true believers on the ground talking to each other. Um, the connections between our institutions, both internally and as a sector, need to be formalised. You use the words formalised partnership. One of the things that the National Forum is absolutely focused on is the fact that no one problem in higher education belongs to a single entity. That unless we're working cleverly and smartly and in formalised ways together, and uh, but I don't even think that's enough, Ursula, because I think even if you have formal membership, even if you are invited to the party, so there are some members of the party that are more important than others, there are some that have more of a voice than others, and there's a lots of different complex dynamics that empower different people um, who do sit around the table. All you need to do, for example, is look at students' unions' representatives at, at academic council to realise that some people have very strong and important voices and other people feel like voices in the <coughs> wilderness. And so I think we need to think in very complex multi-dimensional ways about how we create parity of esteem, not just between uh, abstract roles in, in the end, like research and teaching, but between the kind of concrete roles that people play within the system. At the forum, we're looking very clearly at that, making very strong recommendations around the kinds of formal principles that need to be declared within um, strategies. If you notice one of the things that we've said there is implicit tacit value. That's actually a problem. It's okay to say, oh, we implicitly value the libraries. Of course, we value the libraries. There has to be explicit um, and declared value around things. And that has to be proved in a whole range of different ways. So I completely take your point, Ursula, about not just telling everybody, let's all talk to each other and let's all make sure that uh, we're on the map. Uh, we have to in ensure that there's a strategic com and formal and declared commitment around those things, and we can't be naive about what that means. We Thank maybe you. have time for one more question. At the front. Hi, Sarah. Uh, Lorna Dodd from Maynooth University. Oh, hi, Lorna. Hi. Um, I just wondered if you could comment a little bit on what you feel the student role is in the enhancement of teaching and learning. And um, my metaphor was, um, I would see us as facilitators. Okay, thank you. Um, the student role is crucial. I'm very influenced by Mick Healy's uh, um, Higher Education Academies framework for what a real partnership between students and their academies actually means. And I'm actually quite critical about the extent to which we have real partnerships with our students in the Irish setting. Of course, we're not alone because a lot of other countries are the same. But a uh, student partnership requires a whole range of different features, uh, not just active, a, a few active uh, and politically aware students within their students' union settings, but as a whole system. And um, we, we may receive feedback from students in all sorts of formal ways uh, now in a way that we didn't 10 or 20 years ago. But I'm absolutely convinced that our students can tell us an awful lot more still and, and, uh, about their experience and about how our structures respond to their experiences. And I'm not being facetious, and it's not just because I'm in this room right now with all of you, but the library is a key access point to that. Librarians understand more about student experiences than very many other people within the system. And we haven't picked the brains of either the students who who, uh, who they've spoken to or the librarians themselves adequately to understand uh, what that actually means. Um, so I think that how we hear student voice, how students inform, how students play a strategic role, how students operate in partnership with us, uh, all requires our attention and uh, the National Fund is really committed to developing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmela uh, May I, sorry, to exercise speaker's uh, privilege <laughs> and ask if we can get a question from Michelle because okay. I see her putting up her hand. Well, sorry. I was going to say was we have a couple of extra minutes if there are questions because we're not leaving here. So. Oh. There's one more. I think there's just a notification here that there's room. Okay. I, I, I have access to Sarah all the time. So <laughs> I, I, I Very, yeah, very good. So Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Absolutely. Kira. Yes. Um, thanks, Sarah. That was a great talk. Um, just, uh, I'm going to make some hugely general comments now about the profession of librarianship, but in terms of uh, party crashers, as a profession, 
we wouldn't really be known for our partying or party crashing. And from what you say, you're completely right. We have to get in, we have to be at the table. We all know it, and we all know it's the biggest barrier for us. But it feels like we need a complete personality transplant as a profession for us to do that. And I'm just wondering, from your perspective, have you any suggestions for, for how we do it? OK, well, one, I mean, I, thank you so much, Karen. I, I've often valued my, your insights um, both in, our, in our local settings. Um, I wouldn't recommend personality transplants. I think that, that part of the reason why um, librarians do the things that they do under the radar is because of that kind of non-ego driven sort of real um, sense of commitment uh, to the whole concept of scholarship in its widest sense. Um, I, I think that there are, I, I, I think that boundary spanning is terribly important. And I think as you strategize, every single opportunity that you have to talk to people outside of your walls that cross your boundaries um, in a way that is organized and in a way that i mean that's why this type of group is terribly important because you can d develop a kind of plan of action as a collective that then you can implement on a day-to-day -day basis um, uh, and i you know I, there's there's something about the kind of form of one of the, the first things that i think is terribly important for any group that has to go on a campaign uh, to uh, be at the party and to sit at the tables in, in genuine ways is to do a bit of an audit. And you guys are really good at this kind of work. And to say, well, where, what, where are we not? Where are the gaps? Mm -hmm. Where should we be? And how can we make sure that we create a strategy that allows us uh, the, a stronger voice and stronger influence in a range of different ways? Of course, you may have been doing that for years as well. So I do, it, it might be time to think a little bit differently and to do some kind of quantum reflection on how that might, how that energy and that knowledge um, could be implemented somewhat differently. And I hazard, without being a bit, without being self-congratulatory, but I hazard that the National Forum may represent quite a new route uh, for those types of conversations because now the National Forum has created teaching and learning enhancement connections across the entire sector. Um, it does recognise the library. It has been working with, for example, um, the institutional repository people to look at how all of the valuable material around teaching and learning uh, can be more effectively used. And so we already have some formalised vehicles for that. So um, first step is more conversations with the forum, with myself and with Terry Maguire and with the kinds of projects that have already started and we hope will we'll develop further. Kira, did you have a metaphor, by the way? Bridge. Is what Bridge. OK. That's another good thing to look at. Maybe just very quickly I could get a couple more of those metaphorical words that you reflected on. Empower. Empower. Anything else? Partner. Partner. Gardener. Gardener. And I, I guess nurturer and organizer and uh, creator of order, I suppose, in, uh, uh, and um, that's, a, I, th I think, a really nice metaphor. So your gardeners, your partners, your enablers, your facilitators, your bridges, your empowerers. If there was ever a time that we need to span, span boundaries, now is the time. Um, declaring more about the kind of role that you play, playing explanatory um, roles in terms of the entire system, and bridging, building more of those bridges and bridging the gaps between how, what people understand that the role that you play and, what, and the role that you actually do play and the role that you could play. All of that demands, I think, some attention. Thank you. Thanks a million. Thank you very much.